In 1837, an iron plate was supposedly discovered in the Great Pyramid by Howard Weiss and his team. Now, as the Great Pyramid was built at the beginning of the Bronze Age, most academics have just dismissed this as either a hoax or a mistake. Alternate history buffs, on the other hand, frequently cite this as evidence of high-tech in ancient Egypt. I myself have a different take on it, and I hope that you'll find mine better by the end of this. And if you do, I'm a humble person, so I don't need like these major compliments. You can just keep it simple. Pointing out that my position is superior to both that of PhD-wielding academics and best-selling authors will be good enough for me. Well, hello and welcome to the Dunking. I'm Dan, and in this episode, we're going to be discussing the iron plate that was found in Giza's Big Boy, the Great Pyramid. Howard Weiss was the lead on the team that made the discovery, and nowadays Weiss is best known for taking a kind of military-esque approach to archaeology. You see, he was, he was an officer in the World Dragoon, so it does kind of make sense, and he didn't really like to hear this kind of steady that you would hear with most other archaeological digs. He kind of preferred the and um, so yeah, he used dynamite. Him and his boys would just go blasting all kinds of crap. Now, his man J.R. Hill made the discovery, and I want you to pay close attention to exactly how he describes this. This will be on the test. This is to certify that the piece of iron found by me near the mouth of the air passage in the southern side of the Great Pyramid at Giza on Friday, May 26, was taken out by me from an inner joint after having removed by blasting two outer tiers of stones of the present surface of the pyramid and that no joint or opening of any sort was connected with the above-mentioned joint by which the iron could have been placed in after its original building of the pyramid. Now notice that he said he found it in the pyramid itself, near one of the star shafts that emanate from the king's chamber. Pay attention to that. It didn't take long for serious skepticism to set in. Just 50 years later, Flanders Petrie was back and forth on whether he thought it was contemporary with construction or not. And by the beginning of the 20th century, the academic position was basically, if it was contemporary with construction, it would have to be meteoric iron. There was no way that it was smelted iron. See, meteoric iron is like space rock iron. It falls from the sky in a meteor and goes boom. Hopefully not so big that you get an upper Egypt impact hypothesis out of the deal. But the idea is that there's some iron there that you could grab and work without having to smelt it. You can just kind of bash it around, maybe heat it up a little, and you don't have to actually extract it from the ore like you normally do. Matter of fact, the oldest uh, iron artifacts known to man currently are of uh, some beads that were found in some tombs, uh, rich people tombs, in Egypt, um, long before the py pyramids were supposed to have been built. And by 1932, after the plate had been tested twice, they determined there was not enough nickel in it for it to be meteoric iron, and at that point, academics basically dismissed it as either a mistake or a hoax. As a matter of fact, by the 1960s, those hippie-ass scientists, they were all like, look, man, it was somebody else's stash box, man. You can't blame it on the Egyptians, man. It was like some medieval dude's stash box, and he dropped it down in there by accident, man. You can't blame that on the Egyptians, man. Well, you don't like my hippie impression? Screw you. Now, in 1989, things changed big time. And no, I am not talking about the release of Electric Youth by Debbie Gibson, although that was a big deal. I'm talking about the Journal for the Historical Metallurgical Society releasing a paper titled something like A Metallurgical Investigation of the 1837 Iron Plate Found in Giza, Egypt. It's just a giant-ass name I'll put here on the screen. But basically, the entire point of that paper was that it was contemporary with the construction of the pyramid, that there was a tiny bit of gold on the thing of all things, that it was a bunch of plates hammered together under a lot of heat, and that it was an early form of smelted iron. Now, I would like to read properly from the paper, but it's been scrubbed from all records. I can't find it anywhere, even in the journal's archives, it's not there. And it seems to be because about four years later, the journal put out another paper that was debunking this one, basically. It said that there was no gold found, that they don't think that it was the plates hammered together like that. They don't find the evidence for that. And that they don't think that there's any evidence for this being primitive iron. They think that it was just haphazardly made in the medieval period. Kind of, sort of resembles Middle Eastern iron of the time, they said. Gold was neither observed nor detected anywhere on the plate. The composition and structure of the iron rules out any form of natural iron. Similar iron smelted in the solid state is precluded as some form of molten slag would be essential, which could only be eradicated by melting the iron. A more mundane but tenable explanation of the observed features is that the iron ore was smelted to cast iron in a blast furnace using charcoals of fuel, resulting in a chemically much purer iron than smelted with coal or coke. The iron was then decarburized by the finery process to produce solid wrought iron. The inclusions are likely to have originated either as deliberate additions during the finding as specified in some European accounts or inadvertently during subsequent forging. 
The blast furnace process does not seem to have reached the Middle East until the post-medieval period, and this strongly suggests the plate of iron from the Great Pyramid is of no great antiquity. And so that paper that was published during Tori Amos's reign instead of Demi Gibson's reign ends up on top and they delete the other one from the archives. Now this is problematic to me for a few reasons and I'll explain them here really quickly. The first one is, the second paper heavily cites the first. So I'm looking at a paper that is functionally incomplete for research. It is lacking a ton of the scientific data that you would want. The chemical freaking composition of this metal, eh, most of it's not there. You can see people weighing in on it, but the tables and shit that are normally in these kinds of articles, not there. So thanks for that. Brilliant, brilliant uh, methodology there in um, hiding. You know, the military puts classified over stuff and whatnot, and then they can still know it's classified. I mean, come on, you guys. Figure something out that's better than deleting the freaking shit from the archive. Anyway. <sighs> the next problem that I have with this is we have two papers published five years apart. Two papers. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a mathematician, but it seems to me that you don't have a consensus when you have two papers that have two opposing positions. It seems to me that you would want, I don't know, another paper to weigh in on this so that we would have what, what, you know that voting thing, like two out of three would at least show you. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. This is kind of absurd. We have two papers and one just, oh, boom, it's gone. We'll ignore that one, but this one wins with, again. But the third problem to me is really ridiculous because, all right, how many people that investigate the pyramids and stuff think the archaeologists, the mainstream academics in general just lie? Just lie. Just hide stuff. Just the Swistonians got giant bones and all that crap. Okay, so when you have one paper that's pro this plate of iron being contemporary to the pyramid, and one paper that's opposed to this paper being contemporary to the pyramid, and the pro paper gets scrubbed from the record, what do you think that says to the conspiratorial minded? What do you think that says to these people? I mean, I, I could go on there and make up a paper right now, and it could say all kinds of goofy crap, and, and people would probably buy it hook, line, and sinker. A handful of people certainly would, because academics have left a giant gap Anyway, let's get back to the iron plate. Now, since the plate was so out of place and out of time, by 1994, after the release of that, the consensus of academics was basically that this was either a hoax or a mistake, that Vice's boy Hill either lied or he just was like rooting around in the rubble and found the plate and, and just like, well, I'm between two courses. I don't know the difference between the rubble from blasting and courses of the pyramid. And see, this is a little funny and a little ironic to me because that same expedition is the one that found the cartouche in Khufu's pyramid that was written by one of the workers' crews, but it's the one that they used to attribute it to Khufu for certain. And many alternate historians will frequently question the validity of that cartouche. But they're met with the skepticism of, like, you seriously are going to accuse these guys of just making shit up and lying? But then that same expedition played on the ground. Oh, he just made shit up and lied. It's a, it's, it's a little bit on the ironic side, a little bit funny. But there's a lot of religious significance surrounding iron in the ancient Egyptian resurrection process, as far as we know. Um, King Tut's tomb had some iron implements, and some of them were for the opening of the mouth ceremony, and that is a part of the mummification process, part of the uh, reincarnation of the soul or whatever. Um, the pyramid texts refer to a throne of iron and to gates of iron that are thrown open, both of these involving the gate king going up into heaven, into the duat. And they think some people have theorized, not just woo peddlers, many academics have hypothesized that those star shafts, as they call them, the reason they're pointed at stars is to facilitate the king, the pharaoh, to go up into the night sky. So it would make sense to have an iron gate there. Even if it was just a tiny one, it would be significant symbolically. And then if you speculate just a little, it's easy to imagine why this would be so significant. I mean, imagine a rock falling from the sky and it's got better metal in it than your best smiths can produce. I mean, at that point, it would almost be like manna from heaven, but like better than we can make food. We can't make this. And so you can see where it would have some religious significance. Now, obviously, this doesn't say anything about why an iron plate would end up in the Bronze Age, but it does say why, if it one was available, the Egyptians would want it. So what's it doing there? If Vice didn't lie about it, and it's not space metal, how'd it get there? 
Well, to answer that, we're going to have to jump forward in time. From Debbie Gibson, past Tori Amos, we're going past Alanis Morissette, past Avril Lavigne, all the way up to Adele. In 2008, Hideo Akinuma, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, he published a paper that was on a handful of artifacts that were made out of metal, some of them actually qualifying as steel, that were found in Kalankaya Hoyek, I totally mispronounced that, but what do you want from me, um, Turkey. And these were dated by context, reliably, solidly dated by context, to 2200 BC. That's 4200 BDG, that's 4,200 years before Debbie Gibson, for those of you who do your dating that way. But that's kind of a big deal because some of these actually qualified as iron and there was enough, of, or excuse me, qualified as steel. And there was enough of them there that he actually ended up saying this. These archaeometallurgical results appear to indicate that during the Middle Bronze Age at Kalman Kai Hoyek, iron objects with the composition of steel were being used in daily life and some kind of iron production activity was taking place. So in Turkey, just 300 years before the Great Pyramid was finished, we have enough iron and steel for them to say that it was part of daily life. Now, in order to get to the point of steel, you have to like figure out the admixture stuff that you need to uh, carbon and shit to add to it to actually make it proper steel. And that would, that would imply a degree of experimentation. Like these guys have been doing this for more than a couple of days. And now the iron that's found in the pyramid is not steel, it's iron. So it's pre-experimentation, potentially. Now, since this data was published 29 years after Debbie Gibson, you know, th this is long after all that metallurgical work was done and stuff, and science had basically dismissed this iron plate. But with this new data, I think that you could actually potentially revisit that iron plate. I would like to see that third study I was talking about earlier, done, especially with, you know, 30 years newer tech. But we could look into this again and, and maybe a little bit less skeptically now. It's kind of like Clovis, um, like the pre-Clovis sites, the first ones and those to pop up, they met, were met with tons of scrutiny for obvious reasons, right? They, they, they stand alone. And this iron plate has kind of stood alone for a long time. But now, if you put these two together, it, it, here's the thing. It, it doesn't take a lot of assumptions here to understand like, okay, so say the people in Turkey are making iron and the people in Egypt, this is, I mean, obviously the height of their political and financial power, right? I mean, and the, the pharaohs are sparing no expense in securing their place in the afterlife. Obviously, they're willing to spend half the country's GDP, it looks like, right? If there is iron being produced, even if it's the crappy leftover junk that we can't use for tools from the Turkish perspective of the guys manufacturing it, it's still worth trading to those rich ass Egyptians because they'll just slap it up on their pyramid and pretend it's how they get to see God. That's, that doesn't require a lot of crazy assumptions there. With the data that we have 300 years before that, the iron deteriorates pretty quickly. It does kind of make sense that 300 years before that, there may well been a little bit of iron. And that's really all it would take. If there was a little bit of iron, a nation as powerful as Egypt at the time may well have found a way to procure it. I find that requires a lot less of an assumption than obviously than ancient high tech or that one of the early scientists was just out there bullshit. Oh, you know, I just found this plate on the ground and just pretend that I pulled it out of the pyramid because why not? Eh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But this actually kind of makes sense. I mean, it's like it's primitive iron. It looks like crap. Again, we would need to see some new metallurgical studies with this data taken into account. It would be great if I could look at that study that had all of the different chemical compositions of the uh, plate, but I can't because it's been scrubbed. I've already bitched about this, sorry. One of the things Hancock likes to say a lot is things just keep getting older, and I think this is a great example of that. In this situation, I think it makes a lot more sense that the provenance is accurate as Vice reported it, that the metal plate is contemporary with the pyramid, that it was just some iron that was traded for from a nearby region that was producing iron. Most likely, they were giving them their low quality crap in a day when they weren't very good at refining it. Some of it came out good, some of it came out bad. We'll trade the bad stuff to the Egyptians and we'll make a knife out of the good stuff. Speculation on my part, but again, we do have evidence that it was being used heavily in Turkey just 300 years later. It absolutely makes sense that if the Egyptians, the richest people around back in those days, believed that iron was key to the afterlife, that the people that were manufacturing iron would sell them their low quality leftovers. And like I said, if you think that hypothesis is tremendous, you don't have to toot my horn too much. Just tell me that, you know, I'm better than Gandhi or whatever it is you feel like saying today, and, and I'll accept that. Thank you very much. 
Also, before I go, I want to point out in my community tab right now, I'm asking a question because soon I will be doing a collaborative video with an archaeologist who is publishing a paper soon on Poverty Point, which was featured heavily in Ancient Apocalypse, for those of you who remember. And he's going, he's publishing some new information. A lot of this data hasn't been presented to the public yet. And I have a chance to talk to dude before he's putting this stuff out there into the public. So we can get kind of first crack at some of this. Ask some questions in that tab. Go to my community tab, go ask some questions so that I can hit him with a lot of stuff beyond what just my brain will collaborate. Help me out here. See, my brain comes up with words like collaborate when it's trying to say coalate. I need your help. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Click the bell and, and um, watch the next one. See you next time.